Chapter 9 The Thing in the Shed A Dangerous Place 911 The Wallet A Good Conversation 1. I no longer had to show up at 6 a.m. to feed radar. Mr. Bowditch was able to do it himself. But I'd gotten used to rising early, and I usually rode my bike up the hill around quarter of seven so I could take her out to do her business. After that, because it was Saturday, I thought we might go for a little stroll along Pine Street, where she always enjoyed reading the messages left on telephone poles and leaving a few of her own. That day, there was no walk. When I came in, Mr. Bowditch was at the kitchen table, eating oatmeal and reading a cinderblock-sized book by James Michener. I got myself a glass of orange juice and asked him how he slept. Made it through the night, he said without taking his eyes from his book. Not much of a morning person was Howard Bowditch. Of course, he wasn't much of an evening person either, or noon, for that matter. Rinse that glass when you're done. I always do. He grunted and turned a page in his cinder block, which was called Texas. I gulped the rest of my juice and called for Radar, who came into the kitchen, hardly limping at all. Walkies? I said. Ready you want to go walkie walk? Jesus, Mr. Bowditch said. Enough with the baby talk. In human years, she's 98. Radar was at the door. I opened it, and she picked her way down the back steps. I started to follow her, then remembered I'd need her leash if we were going to walk on Pine Street. Nor had I rinsed my juice glass. I did the glass and was heading for the peg in the front hall, where the leash hung, when Radar started to bark. Harsh and fast and very, very loud. It was the farthest thing from her I-see-a-squirrel bark. Mr. Bowditch snapped his book shut. What the fuck is up with her? You better go see. I had a very good idea of what was up with her because I'd heard that sound before. It was her intruder alert bark. She was once more crouched down in the backyard grass, which was now much shorter and mostly poop-free. She was facing the shed, her ears laid back and her muzzle wrinkled to show her teeth. Foam flew from her mouth with each bark. I ran to her and grabbed her collar and tried to pull her back. She didn't want to come, but it was clear she also didn't want to go closer to the locked shed. Even with the fusillade of barks, I could hear that weird scraping, scratching sound. This time it was louder and I saw the door moving a little. It was like a visible heartbeat. Something was trying to get out. Radar, Mr. Bowditch called from the porch. Get back here, now! Radar paid no attention, just went on barking. Something inside the shed hit the door hard enough for me to hear the thud. And there was a weird mewling sound, sort of like a cat, but higher in pitch. It was like listening to chalk scream on a blackboard, and my arms hucked up in goose flesh. I got in front of Radar to block her view of the shed and moved at her, making her back up a step or two. Her eyes were wild, showing rings of white, and for a moment I thought she was going to bite me. She didn't. There came another of those thuds, more scratching sounds, than that horrible high-pitched mewling. Radar had had enough. She turned and fled back to the porch, showing not a single sign of a limp. She scrambled up the steps and huddled at Mr. Bowditch's feet, still barking. Charlie, get away from there! Something's inside and trying to get out. It sounds big. Get back here, boy. You need to get back here. Another thud. More scratching. I had a hand over my mouth as if to stifle a cry. I don't remember putting it there. Charlie! Like Radar, I ran. Because as soon as I couldn't see the shed anymore, it was easy to imagine the door busting off its hinges and some nightmare coming after me, skittering and lurching and making those inhuman cries. Mr. Bowditch was wearing his awful Bermuda shorts and his old slippers, which he called scuffs. The healing wounds where the fixator rods had gone into his flesh were very red against his pale skin. Get inside! Get inside! But what? Nothing to worry about. That door will hold, but I need to take care of this. I came up the steps and was in time to hear what he said next, although he lowered his voice as people do when talking to themselves. Son of a bitch, move the boards and blocks. Must be a big one. I heard something like that before when you were in the hospital, but not as loud. He pushed me into the kitchen and then followed, almost tripping over Radar, who was cowering at his feet.
then catching himself on the door jam. Stay here. I'll take care of this. He slammed the door to the backyard, then went limping and scuffling and swaying into the living room. Radar followed, her tail drooping. I heard him muttering, then a pained curse followed by a grunt of effort. When he came back, he was carrying the gun I'd asked him to bring downstairs. But not just the gun. It was in a leather holster, and the holster was attached to a leather belt, studded with silver conchos. It looked like something out of Gunfight at the OK Corral. He cinched it around his waist so the holstered revolver rested just below his right hip. Rawhide strings, tie-downs, dangled against his madras shorts. It should have looked ridiculous, he should have looked ridiculous, but it didn't, and he didn't. Stay in here. Mr. Bowditch, what? You can't- Stay in here, goddammit! He grasped my arm so hard it hurt. He was breathing in quick rasps. Stay with the dog. I mean it. He went out, slamming the door behind him, and side-saddled down the steps. Radar bunted her head against my leg, whimpering. I stroked her, distractedly, looking through the glass. Halfway to the shed, Mr. Bowditch reached into his left pocket and brought out his ring of keys. He picked one out and went on. He put the key in the big padlock, then drew the forty-five. He turned the key and opened the door, pointing the gun at a slight downward angle. I expected something or someone to come bursting out at him, but that didn't happen. I did see movement, something black and thin, then it was gone. Mr. Bowditch stepped into the shed and pulled the door shut behind him. Nothing happened for a long, long time that actually couldn't have been more than five seconds. Then there were two gunshots. The shed walls had to be very thick because the sounds, which must have been deafening in that enclosed space, came to me as a pair of flat, toneless thuds, like a sledgehammer with its head swaddled in felt. There was nothing for a lot longer than five seconds, more like five minutes. The only thing that held me was the imperative tone of Mr. Bowditch's voice and the utterly fierce look on his face when he told me to stay in here, goddammit. Finally, though, that couldn't hold me any longer. I was sure something had happened to him. I opened the kitchen door, and just as I stepped out onto the back porch, the door of the shed opened, and Mr. Bowditch came out. Radar bulleted past me, no sign of arthritis then, and cut across the yard to him as he shut the door and snapped the padlock into place. A good thing he did, because it was the only thing that he had to hold on to when Radar jumped up on him. Down, Radar, get down. She went to her belly, tail wagging like mad. Mr. Bowditch came back to the porch much more slowly than he'd gone down to the shed, limping noticeably on his bad leg. One of the scars had broken open and blood was oozing out in dark red beads. They reminded me of the rubies I'd seen in Mr. Heinrich's back room. He had lost one of his scuffs. Little help, Charlie, he said. Fucking legs on fire. I slung his arm around my neck, grasped his bony wrist, and almost hauled him up the steps and into the house. Bed. I have to lie down. Can't catch my breath. I got him into the living room. He lost his other scuff on the way because his feet were dragging, and got him on the rollaway. Jesus Christ, Howard, what was that? What did you shoot? Pantry, he said. Top shelf. Behind those bottles of Wesson oil. Whiskey. This much. He held his thumb and forefinger a smidge apart. They were trembling. I had thought he was pale before, but now, with those red spots fading from his cheeks, he looked like a dead man with living eyes. I went into the pantry and found the bottle of Jameson's where he said it would be. Tall as I am, I had to stand on tiptoe to reach it. The bottle was dusty and almost full. Even as wrought up as I was, scared, almost panicked, the smell when I uncapped it brought back vile memories of my father lolling on the couch in a semi-stupor or hung over the toilet retching. Whiskey doesn't smell the same as gin, yet it does. All alcohol smells the same to me, of sadness and loss. I poured a small knock in a juice glass. Mr. Bowditch tossed it down and coughed, but some of the color came back into his cheeks. He unbuckled the gaudy gun belt. 
Get this fucking thing off me. I pulled the holster and the belt slithered free, Mr. Bowditch giving a muttered fuck when the buckle must have scraped the small of his back. What do I do with it? Put it under the bed. Where did you get the belt? I had certainly never seen it. At the getting place, just do it. But before you do, reload it. There were bullet loops on the belt between the conchos. I rolled the big gun cylinder, filled the two empty chambers, holstered the gun, and put it back under the bed. I felt like I was dreaming awake. What was it? What was in there? I'll tell you, he said. But not today. Nothing to worry about. Take this. He gave me his key ring. Put it on that shelf there. Give me two of those oxys, and then I'm going to sleep. I got him the pills. I didn't like him taking high-tension dope after high-tension whiskey, but it had only been a small knock. Don't go in there, he said. You may in time, but for now, don't even think of it. Is it where the gold comes from? That's complicated, as they say on the afternoon soap operas. I can't talk about it now, Charlie, and you must not talk about it to anybody. Anybody. The consequences. I can't even imagine. Promise me. I promise. Good. Now go away and let an old man sleep. Two. Radar was usually happy to go down the hill with me, but that Saturday she wouldn't leave Mr. Bowditch's side. I went down solo and fixed myself a deviled ham sandwich on Wonder Bread, the snack of champions. My dad left a note saying he was going to a 9 a.m. AA meeting and bowling with Lindy and a couple of his other sober friends afterward. I was glad. I would have kept my promise to Mr. Bowditch no matter what. The consequences I can't even imagine, he'd said. But I'm pretty sure Dad would have seen something on my face anyway. He was a hell of a lot more sensitive to things like that now that he was sober. Usually that's a good thing. That day, it wouldn't have been. When I got back to number one, Mr. Bowditch was still asleep. He looked a little better, but his breathing had a raspy quality. It was the way he'd sounded when I found him halfway up the porch steps with his leg broken. I didn't like it. By the evening, the rasp was gone. I made popcorn, shaking it up old school on the hot point stove. We ate it while watching HUD on my laptop. It was Mr. Bowditch's pick, I'd never heard of it, but it was pretty good. I didn't even mind that it wasn't in color. At one point, Mr. Bowditch asked me to freeze the picture while the camera was close up on Paul Newman. Was he the handsomest man that ever lived, Charlie? What do you think? I said he could be right. I stayed Saturday night. On Sunday, Mr. Bowditch seemed better still, so I went fishing with my dad off the South Elgin Dam. We didn't catch anything, but it was nice to be with him in the mellow September sunshine. You're awful quiet, Charlie, he said on the way back. Anything on your mind? Just the old dog, I said. This was mostly, but not entirely, a lie. Bring her down this afternoon, Dad said, and I tried, but Radar still wouldn't leave Mr. Bowditch. Go sleep in your own bed tonight, Mr. Bowditch said. Me and the old girl will be fine. You sound hoarse. Hope you're not coming down with something. I'm not. Just been talking most of the goddamn day. To who? Whom? To myself. Go on, Charlie. Okay, but call if you need me. Yes, yes. Promise. I gave you mine yesterday, now you give me yours. I promise, for Christ's sake. Now put an egg in your shoe and beat it. Three. On Sunday, Radar was no longer able to climb the back porch steps after doing her morning business, and she only ate half of her food. That night, she ate none of it. Probably she just needs to rest, Mr. Bowditch said, but he sounded doubtful. Double up on those new pills. Are you sure? I asked. He gave me a bleak smile. What can it hurt at this point? 
I did sleep in my own bed that night, and on Monday, radar seemed a little better. But Mr. Bowditch had also paid a price for Saturday. He was using his crutches again to get back and forth from the bathroom. I wanted to ditch school and stay with him, but he forbade it. That night, he seemed better, too. Said he was bouncing back. I believed him. More fool me. Four. On Tuesday morning at ten o'clock, I was in advanced chem. We were split into groups of four, dressed in rubber aprons and gloves determining the boiling point of acetone. The room was quiet except for murmuring voices, so the sound of my cell phone when it rang in my back pocket was very loud. Mr. Ackerley looked at me with disapproval. How many times have I told you kids to silence you? I took it from my pocket and saw Bowditch. I dropped my gloves and took the call going out of the room, ignoring whatever Ackerley was saying. Mr. Bowditch sounded strained, but calm. I believe I'm having a heart attack, Charlie. Actually, I have no doubt. Did you call? I called you, so be quiet and listen. There's a lawyer, Leon Braddock, in Elgin. There's a wallet under the bed. Everything else you need is also under the bed. Do you understand that? Under the bed. Take care of radar. And when you know everything, decide, he gasped. <laughs> Fuck, how that hurts. Like big iron in the forge. <laughs> when you know everything, decide what you want to do about her. That was it. He clicked off. The chem room door opened as I was calling 911. Mr. Ackerley came out and asked me what the hell I thought I was doing. I waved him off. The 911 operator asked me what my emergency was. With Mr. Ackerley standing there with his mouth ajar, I told her and gave her the address. I untied my apron and let it fall to the floor. Then I ran for the door. Five. That was probably the fastest bike ride of my life, standing on the pedals and slicing across streets without looking. A horn blared, tires screeched, and someone hollered, Watch where you're going, you dumb shit! Fast as I was, the ER guys beat me. When I swerved around the corner of Pine and Sycamore, putting one foot down and dragging it on the pavement to keep from wiping out, the ambulance was just pulling away with its lights flashing and its siren whooping. I went around back. Before I could open the kitchen door, radar bulleted through the dog door and was all over me. I went to my knees to keep her from leaping up and stressing those fragile back hips. She whined and yipped and licked my face. Don't even try to tell me she didn't know something bad had happened. We went inside. A cup of coffee was spilled on the kitchen table, and the chair he always sat in, it's funny how we pick our spots and keep to them, was overturned. The stove was still on, the old-fashioned percolator too hot to touch and smelling charred. Smelling like a chemistry experiment, you could say. I turned off the burner and used an oven mitt to move the percolator to a cold burner. During all this, Radar never left my side, leaning her shoulder against my leg and rubbing her head on my knee. A calendar was lying on the floor beside the entry to the living room. It was easy to imagine what had happened. Mr. Bowditch drinking coffee at the kitchen table, the percolator staying hot on the stove for a second cup. A hammer hits his chest. He spills his coffee. His landline is in the living room. He gets up and goes in there, knocking over his chair, staggering once and pulling the calendar off the wall as he braces himself. The retro phone was on the bed. There was also a wrapper that said papaverine, something they had injected before transporting him, I supposed. I sat on the rumpled rollaway, stroking radar and scratching behind her ears, which always seemed to calm her. He'll be okay, girl. Wait and see, he'll be fine. But in case he wasn't, I looked under the bed where, according to Mr. Bowditch, I'd find everything I needed. There was the holstered gun on its concho-studded belt. There was his key ring and a wallet I'd never seen before. And there was an old-fashioned cassette tape recorder that I had seen, perched atop one of the plastic milk crates of rickrack on the third floor. 
I looked in the recorder's window and saw there was a Radio Shack cassette in the machine. Either he had been listening to something or recording something. My money was on recording. I put the key ring in one pocket and the wallet in another. I would have put the wallet in my backpack, but it was still at school. I took the rest of the stuff upstairs and put it in the safe. Before closing the door and spinning the combination, I went to one knee and plunged my hands wrist deep in those gold pellets. As I let them sift through my fingers, I wondered what would happen to them if Mr. Bowditch died. Radar was whining and barking from the foot of the stairs. I went down, sat on the rollaway, and called my dad. I told him what had happened. Dad asked how he was. I don't know, I didn't see him. I'm going to the hospital now. Halfway across the goddamn bridge, my phone rang. I pulled into the Zipmart parking lot and took the call. It was Melissa Wilcox. She was crying. He died on the way to the hospital, Charlie. They tried to revive him, they tried everything. But the infarction was too bad. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I said I was too. I looked at the window of the Zipmart. The sign there was the same a heaped plate of fried chicken that was the best in the land. The tears came and the words blurred. Mrs. Zippy saw me and came out. Everything all right, Charlie? No, I said. Not really. There was no point in going to the hospital now. I pedaled back across the bridge and then walked my bike up Sycamore Street Hill. I was too pooped to ride, especially not up that steep grade. I stopped outside our house, but that house was empty and would be until my father got home. Meanwhile, there was a dog that needed me. I guessed she really was my dog now. Six. When I got back to Mr. Bowditch's house, I spent some time petting Radar. I cried while I did it, partly from shock, but also because it was sinking in. There was a hole where I'd had a friend. The stroking soothed her, and it did the same for me, I guess, because I began to think. I called Melissa back and asked if there would be an autopsy. She told me there wouldn't be because he hadn't died unattended and the cause was clear. The coroner will write out a death certificate, but he'll need some ID. Do you have his wallet by any chance? Well, I had... A wallet. It wasn't the same as the one Mr. Bowditch carried in his hip pocket. That one was brown, and the one I'd found under the bed was black. But I didn't tell Melissa that. I just said I had it. She said there was no rush. We all knew who he was. I was starting to wonder about that. I googled Leon Braddock's number and called him. The conversation was short. Braddock said that all of Mr. Bowditch's affairs were in order because he had not expected to live long. He said he didn't intend to buy any green bananas. I thought that was charming. The cancer, I thought. That was why he put his affairs in order. That was what he expected to get him, not a heart attack. Did he come to your office? I asked. He did, earlier this month. When I was in school, in other words, and he hadn't told me anything about it. I bet he took a Uber. Beg pardon? Nothing. Melissa, his physical therapist, says someone, the coroner, I guess, needs to see ID for the death certificate? Yes, yes. Just a formality. If you take it to the hospital's front desk, they'll make a photocopy. Driver's license, if he still has one. Even an expired one would do, I think. Something with a picture. Not a rush. They'll release the body to the funeral home without it. I don't suppose you have any idea which funeral home? Crosland, I said. It was the one my mother was buried out of. Right here in Sentry? Very good. Very good. I'll take care of the expenses. He left money in escrow for just such a sad eventuality. Please tell me what the arrangements are. Perhaps your parents can take care of that. I want to see you afterward, Mr. Reed. Me? Why? I'll tell you when I see you. It will be a good conversation, I think. 
Seven. I gathered up Radar's food, dish, and meds. There was no way I was going to leave her in that house where she'd wait for her master to come back from wherever he'd gone. I clipped her leash to her collar and walked her down the hill. She went slowly but steadily and mounted our porch steps with no trouble. She knew the place now and went immediately to her water dish. Then she lay down on her rug and went to sleep. Dad came home shortly after noon. I don't know what he saw on my face, but he took one look and pulled me into a strong hug. I started crying again, this time a real flood. He cupped the back of my head and rocked me as if I were still a little boy, and that made me cry even harder. When the waterworks finally stopped, he asked if I was hungry. I said I was, and he scrambled half a dozen eggs, throwing in handfuls of onions and peppers. We ate, and I told him what had happened. But there was plenty I didn't tell him about. The pistol, the noises in the shed, the bucket of gold in the safe. I didn't show him the key ring, either. I thought I might come clean soon, and he'd probably give me hell for holding back but I was going to keep the crazy stuff to myself until I listened to that cassette tape. I did show him the wallet. In the billfold were five dollar bills of a sort I'd never seen before. Dad said they were silver certificates, not all that rare, but as retro as Mr. Bowditch's TV and hot point stove. There were also three items of identification. A social security card made out to Howard A. Bowditch, a laminated card declaring Howard A. Bowditch was a member of the American Woodsman's Association, and a driver's license. I looked at the photo on the Woodsman's Association card with fascination. In it, Mr. Bowditch looked about 35, surely no older than 40. He had a full head of blazing red hair, combed back from his unlined forehead in neat waves, and he was wearing a cocky grin I'd never seen. Smiles, yes, even a grin or two, but nothing this carefree. He was wearing a plaid flannel shirt, and he certainly looked like a woodsy-type guy. A simple woodcutter, he'd said to me not all that long ago. The fairy tales are full of them. This is really, really good, my dad said. I looked up from the card I was holding. What is? This. He passed me the driver's license which showed Mr. Bowditch at sixty or so. He still had plenty of red hair, but it was thinning and fighting a losing battle against the white. The license had been good until 1996, according to what was printed below his name, but we knew better. Dad had checked online. Mr. Bowditch had a car somewhere, but had never held a valid Illinois driver's license, which was what this purported to be. I guess Mr. Heinrich might have known someone who could create fake DLs. Why? I asked. Why would he? Maybe lots of reasons. But I think he must have known a valid death certificate couldn't be issued without at least some identification. Dad shook his head, not with irritation, but admiration. This, Charlie, was burial insurance. What should we do about it? Roll with it? He had secrets, I'm sure, but I don't think he ever robbed banks in Arkansas or shot up a bar in Nashville. He was good to you and good to his dog, and that's good enough for me. I believe he should be buried with his little secrets, unless his lawyer knows them. Or do you think differently? I don't. What I was thinking was that he'd had secrets, all right, but not little. Unless you considered a fortune in gold little, that was. And there was something in his shed. Or had been, until he shot it. 8. Howard Adrian Bowditch was laid to rest just two days later on Thursday, the 26th of September, 2013. The service took place at the Crossland Funeral Home, and he was buried at Sentry's Rest Cemetery, my mother's final resting place. Reverend Alice Parker conducted a non-sectarian service at my father's request. She had also officiated at my mother's service. Reverend Alice kept it short, but even so, I had plenty of time to think. 
Some of it was about the gold, but more of it was about the shed. He had shot something in there, and the excitement killed him. It took a little while, but I was sure that had done it. Present at the funeral parlor service and at the cemetery were George Reed, Charles Reed, Melissa Wilcox, Mrs. Althea Richland, a lawyer named Leon Braddock, and Radar, who slept through the funeral service and spoke up just once, at graveside, a howl as the coffin was lowered into the ground. I'm sure that sounds both sentimental and unbelievable. All I can say is it happened. Melissa gave me a hug and a kiss on the cheek. She told me to call her if I wanted to talk, and I said I would. I returned to the parking lot with Dad and the lawyer. Radar walked slowly beside me. Braddock's Lincoln was parked next to our humble Chevy Caprice. There was a nearby bench in the shade of an oak whose leaves were going gold. Perhaps we could sit here for a few moments, Braddock asked. I have something rather important to tell you. Wait, I said. Keep walking. I had my eyes on Mrs. Richland, who had turned to look just as she always had on Sycamore Street, with one hand raised to shade her eyes. When she saw we were going to the cars, or appearing to, she got into hers and drove away. Now we can sit down, I said. I take it that lady is the curious type, Braddock said. Did she know him? No, but Mr. Bowditch said she was a nosy Parker, and he was right. We sat on the bench. Mr. Braddock hoisted his briefcase onto his lap and unlatched it. I said we'd have a good conversation, and I believe you'll agree when you hear what I have to tell you. He took out a folder, and from the folder a small sheaf of papers, held with a gold clip. At the head of the one on top were the words, Last Will and Testament. My dad began to laugh. Oh my God, he left something to Charlie? Not quite correct, Braddock said. He left everything to Charlie. I said the first thing that came to mind, which wasn't exactly polite. You're shitting me. Braddock smiled and shook his head. This is nullum caca statum, as we lawyers say, a no-shit situation. He left you the house and the land it stands upon. Quite a piece of land, as it happens, worth at least six figures, high six figures, given centuries rest, property values. Everything in the house is also yours, plus a car currently in storage in the town of Carpentersville. And the dog, of course. He bent and stroked Radar. She looked up briefly, then put her head back on her paw. This is really true? Dad asked. Lawyers never lie, Braddock said, then rethought what he'd said. At least they don't in matters such as this. And there are no relatives to contest it? We'll find that out when the will goes through probate, but he claimed to have none. Is it... Is it still okay for me to go inside? I asked. I mean, I have a bunch of stuff there, mostly clothes, but also, um... I couldn't think what else I had at number one. All I could think about was what Mr. Bowditch had done one day earlier that month while I was in school. He might have changed my life while I was taking a history quiz or shooting hoops in the gym. It wasn't the gold I was thinking about just then, or the shed, or the gun, or the cassette tape. I was only trying to get my head around the fact that I now owned, or soon would, the top of Sycamore Street Hill. And why? Just because I'd heard radar howling in the backyard of what kids called the Psycho House one chilly April afternoon? Meanwhile, the lawyer was talking. I had to ask him to rewind. I said, of course, you can go in. It's yours, after all, lock, stock, and barrel. At least it will be, once the will is probated. He put the will back in the folder, put the folder back in his briefcase, snapped the catches, and stood. From his pocket, he fished a business card and gave it to my father. Then, perhaps remembering that Dad wasn't the named legatee of a property worth six figures, high six figures, he gave another one to me. Call if you have questions, and of course I will be in touch. I'll ask that the probate process be expedited, but it still may take as long as six months. Congratulations, young man. 
Dad and I shook hands with him and watched him go to his Lincoln. My father isn't ordinarily a cussing man, unlike Mr. Bowditch, who was apt to drop a goddamn and to pass the salt. But as we sat there on that bench, still too stunned to get up, he made an exception. Holy fuck. Right? I said. Nine. When we got home, Dad brought two Cokes from the fridge. We clinked cans. How do you feel, Charlie? I don't know. I can't get my head around it. Do you think he has anything in the bank, or did the hospital stay clean him out? I don't know. But I did. Not much in citizens, maybe a couple of thousand, but there was the bucket of gold upstairs, and maybe more in the shed, along with whatever else was in there. It doesn't really matter, Dad said. That property is golden. Golden. Right. If this proves out, your college expenses are taken care of. He let out a long sigh, pursing his lips so it made a sound. I feel like a 90-pound weight just slid off my back. Assuming we sell it, I said. He gave me an odd look. Are you telling me you want to keep it? Do a Norman Bates and live in the psycho house? It doesn't look like the haunted mansion anymore, Dad. I know, I know, you really spiffed it up. Got a ways to go. I was hoping to get the whole thing painted before winter. He was still giving me the odd look, head cocked, slight frown creasing his brow. It's the land that's valuable, Chip, not the house. I wanted to argue. The idea of demolishing Number One Sycamore gave me the horrors, not because of the secrets it contained, but because so much of Mr. Bowditch was still in there. But I didn't. There was no point, because there was no money for a full-on paint job anyway, not with the will and probate and no way to convert the gold to cash. I finished my coke. I want to go up there and get my clothes. Can Raid stay here with you? Sure. Guess she'll be staying here from now on, won't she? At least until... He didn't finish, just shrugged. Sure, I said. Until... Ten. The first thing I noticed was that the gate was open. I thought I'd shut it, but couldn't remember for sure. I went around the house, started up the back steps, and stopped on the second one. The kitchen door was open, and I knew I'd closed that one. Closed it and locked it. I went the rest of the way up and saw I'd locked it all right. Splinters were sticking out all around the lock plate, which had been partly torn from the jam. I didn't consider that whoever had broken in might still be there. For the second time that day, I was too stunned to consider very much. The only thing I remember thinking was being glad I'd left Radar at our house. She was too old and fragile for more excitement. <laughs>